Hey there, Jeff Montgomery here, Rifle Smith with Wyoming Gun Company. I uh, just thought this might be a neat video to uh, to show. It's kind of a different one. Uh, finally got a, a PRS rig in to assemble for a customer. Uh, his name's Jordan. He's a local PS, PRS shooter here in uh, Casper. So he competes uh, throughout the country in this kind of loca loca locale uh, of, the, of the country. Uh, he's just getting started. Uh, he's getting started right, obviously. Uh, he's using top-notch gear. Um, going to put together the best package for him, and this, this rifle should be a really good, uh, really good accurate shooter. So uh, I know he's excited to get going on it, and uh, I'm kind of kind of under a deadline. He would, he would like it to buy this weekend, so uh, I got a few more days to go, so I think I, I think I can accommodate that for him. Uh, anyway, I thought I'd go through uh, the components that we got here, uh, so, uh, kind of the process uh, of how I would assemble something like this. Uh, the machining and all that stuff. I'm not going to show the machining of the barrel. Uh, if you're curious of that, I've got quite a few of those already uh, with me on the lathe and pretty much the same process there. We're going to indicate the barrel in within a tenth of a thousandth of an inch, uh, run true, uh, cut, the, cut the breech end, uh, as in fit it, fit it to the receiver, uh, thread it, and then chamber it for the cartridge. Uh, so in this case, uh, the guy's going to go with a 6.5 Creedmoor, excellent cartridge for, for entry level, really even professional level, plenty of professionals still use that. Uh, easy to get components, uh, you can buy box ammo right off the shelf and pretty much uh, uh, hit the ground running with that. Um, so um, let's start with the receiver, uh, he's chosen a, a Zermatt. Uh, this is a model RD3, short action. Uh, Zermatt Arms, uh, I believe, is a bighorn uh, company. Uh, relatively new on the scene. Uh, I don't know exactly how long they've been in business, but uh, really good receiver. Um, here it is. We'll show you the receiver. So it's a nice black nitride finish, uh, side bolt release, um, standard cuts on the bottom. So this will be for a magazine fed. Um, see if I get that on a picture. Origin. So yeah, that's a Bighorn company. I'm not sure if they've changed their name or we got bought out or what, what happened there, but either way, uh, very high end, uh, good uh, receiver. Uh, separate recoil lug. It is pinned on the bottom, so a guy could do run a switch barrel setup if he if he so choose to. Um, separate uh, pinned, also pinned um, a Picatinny rail for your optics. Um, big 840 screws. Um, and uh, the bolt has a, kind of a control round feed feature here where the cartridge would pop up as it's, uh, as it's loaded from the magazine, pop up and be captured by the extractor here. Uh, flat breech, so a very simple machining. Uh, quick and easy. You got a kind of a unique here floating bolt head, kind of like a Savage, except uh, not. <laughs> a little bit different there. Um, the receiver also has, which is not installed right now, but it also has um, what's known as a, a Springfield style ejector. So it's a blade that literally sits in here. Uh, no spring involved, it's just a mechanical operation. When the bolt pulls back, it cams forward and kicks the cartridge out. Very reliable system. Uh, rather than having a spring-loaded ejector on the bolt face, um, it's kind of a preferable way to do it. You know, you got more of a more surface area on the bolt face for the cartridge to sit on um, and handle those pressures. So that's what this little cut here is. Yeah, that's where the ejector would 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 ride through the, the bolt head. Uh, so other than that, it's pretty much straightforward bolt. A little bit fluting on that. Also, nice black nitride coating. They offer uh, interchangeable bolt knobs, like you see here. So, yeah, very nice receiver. Very nice action. As for the barrel, uh, you can see a proof research box on the desk here on the, on the bench. 
So he's got an M24 contour. Uh, let's see, this is a 28 inch, 7.5 twist, four groove, stainless steel uh, barrel. Proof makes some of the best barrels in the industry, I feel. I've chambered probably over 100 by now, probably more than that. Uh, very good barrels, always shoot really well. The company's great to deal with. And uh, so that's a very good choice there. Um, so as I said, I've, I've already machined it, obviously fit it to the, to the receiver. Uh, we put 5.8-24 threads on this. This is just a temporary thread protector here. But he's gonna be running a Thunder Beast Ultra 7, I believe. Uh, uh, suppressor on this, so that's gonna make this another seven inches long. So this is gonna be a very stout rifle. Anyway, moving on from there, gonna be nestled into an MDT XRS chassis system. Very nice chassis. Uh, got the adjustable cheek rest, uh, all kinds of uh, attachments. Uh, you've got your angled grip, vertical grip. So yes, it's a very nice chassis. It uh, looks like a Coyote tan finish. Uh, we're gonna bed this uh, rifle into the chassis. Uh, so I'll show that process. Uh, I haven't gotten into bedding very much lately, so so yeah, that'll be uh, interesting to see. Uh, running a Vortex Razor, uh, very nice optic, Vortex rings. Uh, he's got his bubble level here. We'll be installing a Trigger Tech, uh, Zero Creep, uh, special trigger basically. Uh, this can be set from one pound to 3.5 pounds. And it has the bolt release, which actually in this case is not necessary because we've got a side bolt release on the receiver, but no issues there. Top safety, uh, very nice trigger system. Uh, and then we've got, uh, what is this, a seven, 10 round magazine. So MDT has a kind of a unique double stack single feed that can shove 10 rounds into a smaller compact magazine here. A little bit. A little bit wider here, but certainly not having a real long magazine sticking out of the bottom of your rifle is kind of a beneficial thing. So, very good uh, magazine system there. And I've already test fired it. Uh, cartridge came out real nice. No issues there. No pressure. Um, it is a tight chamber, so it will close on a go gauge, but if you slap a piece of tape on the back of it, uh, cellophane tape, it will not close. Um, so we're right, minimal headspace, absolute minimal. So if he's gonna be reloading his cases, it won't stretch as much. It'll be fairly beneficial for that, as well as accuracy um, and all that good stuff. So um, uh, the barrel comes with this uh, stub at the end. I always cut this off and give it back to the customer. It's got some information on it. Um, might be just a keepsake for him, but it's got the uh, serial number on it, uh, the twist rate, and uh, that's about it. But anyway, um, like I said, I just clean this up, give it back. If a guy wants to keep it, it's his to keep. He bought the barrel. So with all that being said, I think I've covered all that. Uh, I've got my spec sheet, like I always do with any, any rifle, uh, write down all the dimensions, uh, specifications, headspace. <clears throat> I even go through and measure the barrel bore. I scope the barrel with the bore scope to make sure the bore is looking good. There's nothing wrong with the rifling, all that stuff. I record the serial number. Um, again, like I said, the bore size. So bores can vary in, in their uh, diameter, internal di diameter, a little bit here and there. So if you slug it, you could find out roughly what the diameter is, uh, but I use these bushings, um, incrementally sized, uh, in two tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So say, um, in this case, a 6.5 Creedmoor, the imperial dimension of that would be 0.256, and the grooves would be 0.264. So what I do is start with a 0.256 bushing, nominal size, and if that fits in, uh, with a little play, I'll start walking it up. So we'll go from like 2562, 2564, 2566. Usually if they get that big, we, we got an issue, but it also goes down in size. So if it's a little bit tight, we can go with a 255 and so forth. So I kind of go through, but this barrel was actually right on the money at 256. Uh, 2562 was a little bit too tight. 
Um, 2558 was certainly loose. So um, perfect barrel, perfect bore. Uh, when I had it spinning in the lathe, you would see absolutely no fluctuation or run out at all in the bore. Uh, it, it runs true the whole 28 inches, so that's why I like proof research. They just make excellent barrels. Uh, moving on to the front, other things I like to include would be uh, obviously the guy's name, we'll let that out, no serial number, but uh, cartridge, uh, thread extension length, uh, threads per inch. Recoil lug dimensions if that's applicable. Uh, if it's a, a older receiver, I can go through Accurize Blueprint, so I'll record all that information. Uh, the pitch of the threads, the angle, um, whether I'm using a overwire method to, to fit it or if it's just a thread to fit by feel, usually I'll just thread to fit like that. Get the best, not too tight, not too loose. Uh, major diameter, minor diameter. Um, so other specifications, measurements, and then we end up with our headspace, which in this case is 125 thousandths of an inch protruding from the breech. Uh, very similar to a Savage or any other barrel nut system uh, where a guy can basically chamber this. So if this guy wanted to switch barrels, I could chamber, I could fit in chamber to the exact same dimensions and it would headspace perfectly. So it's kind of a nice feature there. And then I got torque specs. I go 100, 100 foot pounds. Uh, barrel length after it's cut, crowned, and what type of crown I'm putting on there. Um, there's a slew of different crowns you can use, flat, 11 degree, recessed, hunter. Really I believe, I mean the crown's kind of an aesthetic uh, appearance thing. Really I believe if the internal crown, meaning the, uh, the, the actual transition from the bullet to the outside of the barrel right here, as long as that's concentric and true, the rest isn't quite as critical. Um, I certainly cut them concentric, but a flat crown, especially on a threaded barrel, you don't have much surface area there anyway for say like an 11 degree. Running it under a brake, running it under a suppressor, a flat crown's perfectly fine in my opinion. I've never had an issue with it. All my customers' rifles shoot extremely well. Uh, again, as long as there's a good 60 degree chamfer on that end, which I'll show you the actual barrel. See if that'll pick up. Right. Right, yeah. I don't know if you can see that chamfer or not. But anyway, we've got a polished flat crown with a 60 degree internal crown, if, if you will. So, uh, I'm gonna transition over. We're gonna prep the stock or the chassis system here for bedding. Uh, then I'll show you some of the bedding process. Uh, we'll, we'll clean that up and just do a final assembly. This rifle will also be Cerakoted. Um, that will be at a later date. Uh, we're kind of backed up on Cerakote right now with other things, but I, I at least want to get this rifle together for the guy so he can at least you know test it out. Maybe I'm, I'm sure he's excited to, to shoot it, get things rolling on that, and then I'll have him bring it back when he's ready, because um, I know there's a match this weekend. I don't know if he's, I'm sure he's not competing, but I, I know he wants to be out there and kind of hang out and, and see what his rifle can do up against the other guys. So trying to get that done for him. So uh, I'm going to cut this here. Hang tight. We'll be right back uh, at a different angle, and we're going to show some of the pre-bedding and then the bedding. And then after it cures, we'll clean it up and pretty much install everything, put it together, do a dry fit function test, probably a t a definitely another test fire, make sure it feeds out of the mag. We want 100% rel reliability on this, obviously if he's competing, he doesn't want any uh, function issues. Shouldn't be, um, never had any issues with the MDT systems or really box magazine at all. So with that being said, I'm gonna cut it from here and we'll be right back. All right, back on the other side of the bench. Um, I like to do my bedding on this side, primarily because all my bedding Supplies are right down here, easy to get to. Um, so, again, with the MDT chassis here, we'll unbox that and show you. Uh, earlier, I said uh, it was coyote brown or something weird like that. It's actually flat dark earth, so forgive me on that. So we'll go ahead and unbox this. Uh, very nice presentation here uh, with the MDT company. So in the box, you get the actual assembled chassis in a nice bag, protected. Uh, sticker and some instructions. 
So I don't think we'll be needing those, hopefully. And here's your additional grips, your straight and angled grips and length of pull. So some spacers basically, so you can increase your length of pull, meaning how far this sits from your shoulder uh, when you're shooting. So a guy with longer arms is gonna need more spacers. And conversely, a guy with shorter arms will lead, need less. Uh, it comes stocked with two installed. Get this bag out of here. So we got two on there, and we'll start there. We haven't quite fit this to the to Jordan's frame yet. Uh, it's very easy to to change. You just undo a couple socket head screws in the back, pop the butt uh, butt pad off, and then add or remove the spacers as ne as necessary. Um, you've got your adjustable cheek piece, which is a very nice feature. So you loosen these two nuts and you can bring your cheek rest up. Very, very nice feature. I know personally I always need a higher cheek, cheek weld on my, on my rifles. So that's very nice. Um, not really a detent system. It's kind of just floating there loose. I kind of like to see the cheek risers with the detent system or a way to repeatedly lock it in. Because what happens when you raise your cheek piece up, especially this high, a guy can't get his bolt out if necessary. So you've got to undo these, lower your cheek piece, pull the bolt out, and then you're not real sure where it was to, be, to start with. Um, so one thing I like to do with that, <clears throat> when I find my optimal uh, cheek height, I will actually put O-rings on, on these rods, like rubber O-rings. Um, and that will give me a stop, basically, and as long as you don't shove it in. You can basically repeat where that height of that cheek piece is. Um, so I'll suggest that to them. Uh, there's other ways to do that. Um, so anyway, very impressive chassis. It's very uh, kind of a mix of uh, aluminum core. So you've got your aluminum bedding block here uh, with polymer, I believe, polymer exterior. Uh, very nice black uh, and flat dark earth combination there. So, uh, we'll begin with getting the action screws out. It looks like the action screws are kind of like pre-installed here so they don't fall out. They've just got little retainer nuts there. And it looks like a 3 16 inch hex. Yeah, 3 16 inch hex wrench. And they're not very tight, so I'll just get rid of those nuts. Set them aside. Okay, screw should fall out, or not. Okay, that's fine. So, uh, we've got paint uh, all over the surface of the batting block. Um, so, part of the preparation, I'm gonna have to remove some of that with sandpaper, uh, get down to the raw aluminum. Um, that way the epoxy batting doesn't chip off or come off uh, inadvertently. It has a better place to stick to. So some of this stuff I'll do on the milling machine just to make it quick and easy and actually looks nice, uh, neat, even though the bedding is going to go over it, uh, just adds a professional touch to it. And then I'll sand off the rest. So we'll set this aside. So first thing to do is just to test fit the, the uh, barreled action into the chassis, make sure we fit. Uh, the barrel has no, uh, it's free floated, it's not touching anything, and we have good, uh, good, uh, action screw torque. So I'll just stick this in the vise here real quick. Change my view. Alright, so we'll take the barrel to action, drop it in, and yeah we got plenty of uh, plenty of room in the uh, barrel channel there. There's no way anything's touching that. So that's very nice. See if I can pardon me while I... Yeah. So, that's basically what it would look like. Um, I don't have a piece of paper, but I guarantee you there's nothing touching there as far as the barrel goes. So, let me screw the action screws in, make sure we're... We're golden there. <clears throat> Certainly don't want to get to the bedding stage with epoxy running all over the place and find out something's not fitting right. 
So install this upside down. Great, they line up, <clears throat> snug down just fine. So, yeah, that's gonna be a pretty sweet rig. Okay, pre checks go well. Um, there's plenty of room for the trigger, I'm not real concerned about that. Sometimes in a more compact sporter, sporter stock or a hunting stock. I always make sure the trigger works, bolt release, things like that, um, just so there's no binding or anything. I want to make sure everything's free-floated, um, has plenty of clearance before we bed uh, because it's really difficult to kind of undo the bedding. <clears throat> um, the magazine release is out here on the trigger guard. That's well out of the way of any bedding. So yeah, I think we're ready to prep the stock here. I'm happy with all this. So let me get set up for that and we'll be right back for pre-bedding, uh, preparing everything and getting it ready for the actual bedding. All right, so be right back. Okay, and then just real quick, um, as an uh, amendment to what I said earlier, again, another correction. Um, I just noticed these two little set screws in, a, in, the, in the bag of the bag and apparently they are used to lock down your cheek rest here. So it's got real nice brass, little brass inserts. So they would, so once you get your height set, you would lock these down in here. The only drawback that I would see is you wouldn't be able to get those out easily and quickly. But at least it does come with a way, MDT does provide a way to lock your, your cheek rest in there. Uh, looks like a hex head. So yeah, you're going to have to carry a couple extra wrenches in your bag. At least I would suggest that in case anything comes loose or you need to take your bolt out or whatever the case may be. So anyway, um, lots of different ways to do it like I said before. Uh, this is just one of many. So with that being said, we'll be right back. All right, back here at the milling machine. Uh, I've got it roughly installed in the device. I was hoping to pull out the actual chassis, the, the, vec the bedding block essentially, um, but I believe a lot of these uh, big nuts are Loctited in. I, I don't know, it felt a little too tight for me. I don't want to start breaking screws or causing more problems than I need right now. So we're gonna roll with it like this, no big deal. Um, there's plenty of cleanup in the, in the end, so shouldn't be any worries there. First thing I'm going to do is make sure we're level. So, got my two axis level here. Very handy for this sort of thing. Let's see, can you see that? Oops. Well, it chucks in the way. Yeah, you can see it there. Just gonna have to trust me here, it's gonna be level. Okay, pretty close, so right there we're good. Let's get a little bit tighter in the vise. I don't like that moving. So I'm kind of fighting the trigger guard here at the bottom of my vise. Yeah, there's too much wiggle there, I don't like that. Hold on, let's move these soft jaws back a touch. if that helps any. There we go, okay. Got a good rigid hold on that. Not that I'm gonna be taking off much material, but we still don't want anything jumping out of the vise. Okay, we're level X and Y. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay, so, just wanna see if we can see what's going on here. Yeah. Now, um, the way these work, it's kind of like a V-block, so, the, so, the, so the, basically the receiver is going to be sitting on two points. 
within the uh, chassis here. The rest of it is all just kind of floating around in the air. Uh, that's why we're going to be doing the bedding to make it all a one 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 to one fit. And the benefit of this is it's just consistency. So there'll be shot to shot. There'll be much less chance of any movement or um, a little bit more solid of a setup, which reduces kind of the overall uh, vibration or uh, shock wave through the system as the cartridge detonates. Keeping everything consistent. Um, that's the name of the game with this consistency. Uh, everything else can be kind of uh, tailored around that, but if you have a nice system that's locked in, no chance of moving, you'll eliminate more variables from uh, inaccuracy, essentially. So, the place you can see, I've installed this a couple times in the chassis, and you can see where it's actually riding in, in this bedding block, essentially. So here, let's see that. Focus, there it is. Uh, you just see a little wear mark right there, and then right there. So I'm not gonna cut that. <clears throat> I will probably sand off the finish, but I'm not gonna actually uh, put any grooving in that or anything like that. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just go along with the end mill, and just put a slight groove right here along this surface. I'm going to deepen the recoil lug area. I will not cut anything off of the back where the recoil lug sits. We don't want to change that dimension. Um, I will make a few cuts, but overall it'll be, I'm not going to face it off, essentially. Um, so we'll clear out all this area, run the end mill back this way. Uh, I've outlined where the tang of the receiver sits, so no need to touch any of this area. And you can't even see that, sorry. There we go. So anyway, there's the outline. <clears throat> I'm not going to touch any of this, obviously. That's, we don't want cuts there. Um, so within this outline, <clears throat> same concept. You can see where the, the receiver sits, which is here and here, but everything else will just lightly uh, relieve some material. Mainly just giving that epoxy something to grab onto to, to stay permanent so that it doesn't uh, chip away or uh, come loose or anything like that. So with that being said, I think I will kick the, end, kick the uh, milling machine on, run my carbide cutter through. Um, being uh, kind of light cuts, I, it's in a drill chuck. I don't want to hear it from the machinists out there. I'm not holding it in a collet. <laughs> the purpose of this is quick change, um, and also, like I said, I'm taking a very skim pass on things. We're not looking for aerospace accuracy here. Um, and the, the reason it's very, very long is after the epoxy cures, I'm gonna come back in and obviously I'm gonna have to come down fairly deep to, to clean up some of the, uh, the spill of the epoxy. You'll see that later on. But like I said, that's, that's the reasoning for this setup. I mean, if I'm doing precision machining, sure, I'll hold it in a collet. Do that proper. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, just uh, saving, saving room on the comments board for, for constructive things instead of why I didn't do that. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's kick this machine on, run the end mill up and down, and do the cuts that I was talking about. Now we've got plenty of exposed raw aluminum here for the bedding to adhere to. All right, so all I need is my action screws. The actual chassis where the barreled action will sit. Now, we will secure that in the vise. We're ready to bed that guy. Um, And I have access to my um, action screws here. Let me reposition this camera. Ah, I think it's fine there. So that, we're going to have to put some, with the screws I like to put uh, paste wax on. Um, it tends to, so what I'll do is put the paste wax kind of on the tip, like so. And then I'm going to heat the heat the screw up, causing the paste wax to melt completely evenly around everything. Very thin coat. Uh, 
just really the idea is just to make sure they don't get stuck. Get my thingy out of the way here. Pick that up. And you can see how it flows. I don't know if you can see that, but anyway, it's it is melted completely. It's 100% contact on that screw, rather than trying to spray it. This just knocks it out in one quick, easy operation. So now the barreled action. Uh, I like to use a release agent made by MAN. It's the uh, Ease Release 200. Uh, just quick and easy. Picked this tip up from Greg Tannel. I've been using it for four years now, and it sure beats mixing up that uh, the stuff you get from Brownells or whatever. Trying to coat all that on, it, it just, this is so much nicer. And I will demonstrate how nice and easy it is. There's some real light coats on that. Get the top side here at the tang. And I like to put a generous amount inside where that front action screw comes out because I always get <clears throat> epoxy that, that runs up through there. And I certainly don't want to glue that into the chamber of the breech area. So we are nicely release agented. And then I do a little bit of the uh, shank of the barrel because the epoxy will smush out everywhere. So I just want to make sure anywhere that's going to touch, we're not going to have any problems. So I will set this aside, let that kind of dry. Okay, everything's got really sagered on it. The chassis system is prepped. Uh, let's get up my. So I like to use Acroglass product of Brownells. Um, I'm not endorsed or, or sponsored by them or nothing, but it, it works real well. It's, it's the one-to-one -one mix, real easy to work with. Uh, it does a real good job. There's plenty of other products you, you can use if you want. Uh, but efficiency is the name of the game with, uh, with me. I got so many rifle builds going on. I don't need to be tinkering around with wasting time on things, so works for me. Got my little kit here. Got brown dye, got black dye. So, uh, I like to use these little portion cups. There we go. Uh, to mix it in. I know I need roughly a, this size of amount and I use this to measure it out with. So you guys, it's a two part, just like any epoxy. Um, a resin and a hardener, um, one to one mix, so real easy to, to mix. And then I'll add some black dye just to match all the, the black finish here. Now with bedding, chassis system is total, totally different than a synthetic stock or a wood stock. Traditionally with a wood stock, we're going to put what's called pillar bedding in there, pillars. Um, and all that is, is a uh, small aluminum literally pillars um, that take up the space between the bottom metal and the action and what that does instead of compressing when you're tightening those action screws up instead of compressing the wood which tends to compress and expand and contract over time and, and throughout the season you're actually torquing to the aluminum pillars so you're kind of taking that wood out of the equation um, and then you'll put bedding all around that just like you would with a synthetic stock, uh, say carbon fiber or fiberglass or whatever, what have you. Now with the fiberglass stocks, a lot of times, at least the quality stocks, they have a bedding block. So essentially what we have here, molded into the, the fiberglass or the uh, whatever material they're using on the stock. So in that case, I would do exactly the same with this, like I did with this, uh, go in there and relief, cut, expose all the raw aluminum, um, sand it if, if necessary. <clears throat> and uh, and then proceed to bed it. Um, the, the nicer thing about those is I don't have to disassemble the entire thing like this. So, a little bit quicker, easier job. But with the chassis, um, 
Obviously it's a matter of taking some screws apart, so it's really not a huge deal. So now I've got this pretty well mixed. <clears throat> kind of a tapioca consistency, a little thicker. So we're done with these tubs. Now I got some black dye, I'm gonna put some black dye in there. A little goes a long way, a couple drops really. That's all that's necessary. Oops. Should be enough, let's see. So you'll see it change to black, black as night. Okay. Now, I'm gonna start here at the recoil lug area and work my way back. Nestle the barreled action in, get the screws in there, and then it's ready for cleanup. I like to clean up before anything cures, much easier. Um, this is a take on Gordy's, Gordy Gritter's process. He taught me all about the cleanup and the not having to mask off everything and just makes everything so, so much more efficient. Okay, yeah, this is mixed well. Let's do a mental checklist here, make sure I'm not forgetting nothing. Yeah, yeah, we're good to go, let's do this. All right, nice big glob right here in the recoil lug area. Oh, and off camera, I had actually masked off the front of the recoil lug <clears throat> because you want you don't want total contact in there. You want a little tiny gap in front of it. Um, just allows for a stress-free um, chassis to action connection. And then with uh, synthetic stocks and wood stocks, normally the uh, action and the barrel is going to sit down a little bit deeper in there into the stock or bedding block. And uh, what you want to do, you don't want parallel surfaces touching, at least this is what Gordy told or taught me, and it makes a lot of sense. So. And say this is our barrel to action. We don't want parallels fully bedded. All we want is the bottom. So anything that's parallel to itself, we would put, I use electrical tape, that's what I was taught by Gordy, um, just to give it a little bit of a clearance. That's all we're looking for. The bottom of the, everything that's nestled in there is gonna be, is gonna be bedded one to one as, as normal. Uh, but the front of the recoil lug, sides of the recoil lug, and the parallel surfaces on the both ends would be masked with uh, electrical tape. And that gives you a little bit of clearance that is good. So just working my way back to the tang area. Um, really very thin coat there's not I mean I'm kind of globbing it in there but I just want to make sure I don't have any um, air pockets or holes or voids and if I get a little spill out it's easy to clean up it's no big deal but this chassis the tolerances are so tight that I'm sure I'm gonna get a ton of squeeze out but that's okay This, uh, another reason I like this Acro Glass is it has a very long working time until it sets up and cures. So I can take my time, do it right, make sure I'm not missing any areas. 
So, yeah. So it looks like a mess at first, and it kind of is. But everything will get cleaned up real nice. And I'm ready to drop this barreled action in. It's very heavy, so I want to make sure it's not going to droop down on me. <clears throat> Scoop this back a tidge. Good deal. So, let's drop this action in. And I'm going to get ready with my action screws here and wrench. Drop that in. I'm going to start with the rear screw. because the whole thing wants to pull forward. So if you get this rear screw started, it won't flop out, flop out on you. So as far as tightness goes, finger tight. I am not gonna crank these at all. One thing I would do in the past, you've probably seen my past video where I did that hunting rifle. Um, I masked everything off, cranked down, torqued the action screws, and then wrapped it with uh, surgical tubing. You don't want to do that. All you're doing is mushing all that epoxy out, basically defeating the whole purpose. So with this, we're giving it a nice, a little bit thicker layer for it to sit in, and I'm not talking much, but I'm certainly not torquing it. So when this all cures, that final torque, you can get a little more torque and a little more, another few threads in, into, the, into, the, into the receiver. Instead of mushing it all out and ruining your work, basically. Okay, so I'm just gonna double check, make sure we're not too tight, not too loose. Make sure we're actually screwed in. Yeah, that's good. And you can see how much is, has squeezed out, and that's a good sign, you know. That can all be cleaned up, who cares? That just means everything's very well covered. Now as far as cleanup goes, Q-tips. And here's my lesson from Gordy. White Vinegar. Stilled White Vinegar. Excellent, excellent for cleaning up uh, bedding. It actually kind of thins it out and allows a very clean finish. Not very much, don't need much. So I'm just gonna grab a four or five of these Q-tips, dunk them in the vine gar. and proceed to clean up. Okay, so I'm just gonna go around, scooping that up. All along the edges. Anywhere that epoxy is squeezed out. So the initial one is just to get the huge globs off. And again, we have this, the working time here is, is phenomenally long. It's not a problem. It's not like I have to rush. First few times I bet it, I was hauling ass because I thought it was all gonna just freeze up on me, but you got plenty of time. So initial glob removal is done. Now I'm going to go do some fine detail work along the 
barrel and edges again. I'm kind of spinning the, the Q-tip as I work along. Kind of rotating it to a fresh side. And you can see that epoxy, I think you can see that. It turns milky. And it's just the Vinegar kind of reacting with it. Thinning it out, essentially. Um, I asked Gordy when I first did this, you know, does this affect when it seeps down in there? Does it thin out the epoxy? But not apparently. And after doing this for a few years now myself, there's no no problem there. Comes out nice. And man, it makes cleanup real, real nice. I mean, you do it here initially when it's still wet, before it's cured. Makes everything look so much nicer. Professional. And I leave a little, leave a little extra here for uh, in case uh, there's a few spots I either clean up too much or what have you. Sometimes you'll run the Q-tip around and scoop out a little more than you really wanted. Especially on these chassis systems where there's a lot of little nooks and crannies to kind of fill up. They all differ from each other a little bit. But like for instance, I noticed <clears throat> right here at the beginning of the tang, I would like a little bridge in there. the safety area. And inevitably I'm gonna to have to come back with the end mill, that's why I left it set up like that. Kind of come back in the end mill and, and, and do the internals where it's uh, seeped out. But again, that's, that's easily done. Guy's paying a lot of money for this, so I wanna make sure it's done right, looks good. And most importantly, it's effective. You know, bedding has a purpose. One of those steps, incremental steps into ultimate accuracy. Smooth some of that out. You know, if it looks good and it shoots good, that's that's ideal. If it shoots good, you know, that's the most important part. But as a, as a professional riflesmith, I want to make sure my products look good. As well as function. Good. Well. So that's why I call this precision bedding. This is what you're going to get if you choose to hire me. You know, it may take several hours. But that's qualities in the details. That's why all my rifles shoot extremely well. Put a lot of care, attention to detail into them. Okay, I'm just doing a final inspection here. See a little bit on this side. It has exposed itself. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, this will be Cerakoted. So a little bit here and there on the barrel is no big deal, it'll all get blasted off. But again, I just, you know, might, might as well clean it up while you can. Okay, that's all great. Obviously this part's not going to be Cerakoted, so definitely don't want any bedding on that. 
where it's showing. All right. Uh, we got a flashlight. Oh, there's a little, little bit right there. Oh, whole bunch right there. Make sure our gas ports are clear, which they are. All right, I'm happy with this. The top side's good. <clears throat> I'm gonna set this aside out of the way, let it cure overnight, and we'll come back tomorrow and clean it up.